Good evening and welcome to our latest in conversation. This evening we're delighted to be joined by author Dominic Nolan. These events are free but if you'd like to give a donation to the charity that runs 54 libraries in Devon and Torbay, Libraries Unlimited, there is a link in the chat. We're also posting to over 30 libraries this evening so hello to the other libraries watching and if you'd like to ask a question if you pop it in the chat I'll ask Dominic on your behalf. Um, we've also got a new program that Libraries Unlimited are running through our Evolve program. They've released a exciting opportunity for young writers. So if you're age 15 to 25 or know somebody um, who is age 15 to 25, you have the chance to submit some work and win an iPad. Um, create, created, we have created what if, oh, I've got my words out. What if you spoke? A series of masterclasses. Uh, which cover a range of writing mediums and they're led by authors such as Laura Dockrell, Deanna Roger, Kirsten Logan and many more and they're all free to stream and can be found on the Evolve website which we'll also post um, at the end. So um, Dominic lives in London, he is an author of the widely acclaimed Past Life and After Dark, both which have both received glowing reviews from the press and fellow authors alike. And Dominic has been shortlisted for a CWA short story dagger 2021. Good evening, Dominic, and thank Good you evening, for joining Dan. us. Oh, um, this evening, we are talking about your wonderfully placed book, uh, Vine Street, which I also have here, which is a bit of a beast, but actually, it's a bit of a beast that you get through really quickly. Um, would you like to just tell us a bit about it? Yep, uh, it's essentially a murder mystery. Um, it's based on um, a real case in the 1930s in Soho, 1935-1936. There were a series of uh, murders. Um, three women were strangled in their homes, flats in Soho, within a couple of hundred yards of each other over a couple of months. And a Latvian-born uh, pimp, Max Gassell, was also murdered. And the police investigation had assumed that there was some connection between this um, because at least two of the women um, were sex workers. So there appeared to be some kind of uh, social or cultural connection between the victims. But none of the crimes were solved. And the police never really established if there was a connection or not. So from those building blocks, I kind of take a fictional digression from history and set about solving it um, in an imaginative way. It, it's great. It's, I mean, it, what sort of inspired you? Because the book is set in Soho in 1935 um, and you said about it was basically inspired inspired on the the murder the murders that happened what sort of did you come across that story did was something that happened that sort of drew you to it and um, actually the it was more the setting the jazz clubs that interested me um, jazz was a pretty new thing I mean it was starting to take take hold in America at that point but here um, even among the, the black communities in this country, Calypso was still a thing. So jazz was very much new and trying to worm its way in. Um, and there'd been some legal uh, cases surrounding nightclubs in London at the time and a ruling that you could provide what they technically called advanced catering, which meant that you could essentially sell drinks at a bar and claim that everybody that came had pre-ordered them, which means you didn't need a license. So there was just a proliferation of these basement and first floor clubs that opened in Soho. Um, and they did only stay open for a few months before the police sort of almost bullied them out of existence. But the same owners would just bounce around between different mm. locations. And this kind of subterranean culture interested me um, because Soho at that time, Soho would still be quite recognizable as it is today in terms of the kind of place it was. I mean, it, it Originally, Soho had been built, um, designed to be a place for wealthy Londoners to live. They'd never really taken hold. It never really sort of supplanted Bloomsbury or Mayfair in that regard. And in its early days, it had been considered a French enclave because there were a lot of uh, Huguenots living there. But by the 20th century, a lot of the bigger properties had either been knocked down and rebuilt or had been broken up into smaller places. Um, and there was a lot of uh, immigrant communities moving in. So there were Italians, Greeks. Um, a lot of the Jewish community that had initially come and lived in the East End was moving west. And you had the sort of uh, dress shops and tailors in Berwick Street that lasted so long there in the markets. And you had a growing uh, West Indian diaspora in the area. And that was the interesting bit because the, the different communities never really 
certainly didn't socialize together very often initially. But with the advent of the jazz clubs, you had a situation where shop owners were leasing out their basements or their upper floors um, in order to run jazz clubs. And it was very difficult for, if you were West Indian at the time, to actually buy property or lease property. That wasn't something that property owners were, were interested in doing. So you had this sort of fusion between the Italian and the Greek communities leasing their properties to black uh, musicians and impresarios to run their clubs. So all of a sudden, you had a real melting pot happening, at least nocturnally, in these clubs. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you had Darby Sabini and the Italian gangs who were running rackets in the area, so there was protection money to be considered. Um, the Metropolitan Police always liked to taste of that kind of thing. You'd had a, a massive scandal only a few years before uh, Cape Merrick and the 43 Club. There was a sergeant from Vine Street who was sent down for years over that. Um, so all of these things kind of came together in one sort of uh, cauldron, really, these clubs. And, and that was what fascinated me. And the, the murder was sort of the, I guess, the spark, the plot spark that I used just to set everything into motion. Yeah, because like you said, the you know war was looming. The gangs were rife. Mm. I mean, the the book is is really gripping. You know, really, you know, there's there's so much going on, and it's so atmospheric. You know, you feel like you're there in those sort of dark sort of alleyways and and clubs. And and when the murder takes place, it's it's not really a surprise. That, I mean, it takes place quite early on, doesn't it? The first one. Um, and then we meet Leon, um, Leon Ge Geats, Geats. Um, who is one of the police officers on who is investigating um, mm. the murder? Um, and so, did you sort of you said that the police were sort of involved? And was there was is Leon based on anybody, um, or no. is he just he's fic he is the sort of Leon, like, yeah. What's, fi what's yeah, what's real, what's fiction? So there are a lot of historical characters in it. So um, Leon ends up partnering up with a guy called Mark Cassar from The Flying Squad, yeah. who was a former partner of his. Now, both of those are fictional characters, but Mark Cassar's boss at Flying Squad is Nutty Sharp, who was a real character. He was the, the head of The Flying Squad. And I've got some other coppers, um, inspectors, Minter and Lander, who are real people. I mean, there's probably about 60 or 65 characters who are historical characters that show up in one form or another. Um, but the, the three main ones, uh, Leon Mark and uh, Billy Massey, who's a oh, WPC yeah. at the time, are uh, fictional. Although Billy Massey is named for a real WPC that was killed during the war, just as a sort of a uh, homage to her. Was was it quite? Um, I don't can't remember like how long WPCs because I mean even in the sort of sixties, WPCs were still sort of you know, and she's was, quite involved, isn't she? You know. Yeah, they were they were a pretty new thing. Um, Initially, they'd been uh, sort of a voluntary service, um, even before the first war. And then after the first war, it was something that the commissioner of the Met tried to get rid of. He didn't, didn't see any value in, in women being police officers. Um, but there was, a, um, there was a woman, Dorothy Pato, who became quite powerful in the police. And she had argued that one thing, I think to get their foot in the door, but one thing that women were a lot better than men at were talking to other women and to children. Mm. So this is really why the um, there was an, a division specifically for women police officers set up, and then they would be seconded to different divisions. And Vine Street was one that usually had at least one WPC, simply because of the nature of what went on in Soho. I mean, you know, it was the entertainment part of London at that point, as it still is now. So that went hand in hand with sex work and, you know, women in nightclubs, mm -hmm. things like that, um, which where people store the value of, of, of women officers at that time. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, they're not even called WPCs anymore because the distinction is meaningless. But yeah. back then, it was still very much sort of women's work and then the real police work from then. Um, like but I tried to involve Billy in a little bit more, um, a little bit more than just interviewing. <laughs> yeah, well, she does, doesn't she? She's really sort of part of, you know, intri intrinsically part of the story. You know, she's she's there from the beginning and, um, you know, she has a, a, a as big a role, you know, um, she's not sort of, I was I was pleased that she doesn't get a sort of a, a little side role. You know, she is very much in the sort of hub of it all, isn't she, when it's going on? Yeah. And I also I mean, loved, I mean, uh, sorry, go on. So I was going to say, I also love Tallulah, the kitten. I thought that was, <laughs> I, I love cats. <laughs> she had a cat in there. I mean, that was, that was got me straight away. <laughs> the pocket cat. Yeah. yeah. yeah Tallulah's <laughs> a, a big supporting role.
sorry, you were going to say about. Um, I was going to say with, just with Billy, I, I mean, a lot of the book is about that obsession that can sometimes be an oddly male obsession. I think um, with some of these murder mysteries about being obsessed with the the dead victims as opposed to people that are still alive, and I think Billy sort of provides a sort of leaving a leavening sort of. Uh, mm presence in there to try and keep uh, Leon on track and um, does not, not always successfully because Leon's a little bit rogue sometimes and he, and he does get a little bit too deep into matters but, um, but yeah she's definitely a sort of a, a humanising factor I think. The, the book um, sort of I recognise places that you refer to in the book like Neil's Yard and, and Seven Dials which people who um, know London and shop in London now know they're both you know fairly affluent areas with you know the restaurants the, the shops and um you know those so it's very different um to was it to how it was back then um how did you re- sort of research those um those areas to um you know to to be able to you know to, to sort of envisage what it was like i mean yeah it, it was tricky the specifics i mean fortunately in terms of the actual street geography um, Soho and, and the West End in general isn't that different now to how it was in the 30s because it wasn't massively affected by the war yeah. because there was no strategic target anywhere near it. You know, blowing up nightclubs wasn't wasn't a number one priority. Um, so unlike sort of south of the river or where the docks are in the east, yeah. um, Soho got away fairly lightly. In fact, most of the damage done there, um, and the book covers, there's a bomb drops on Berwick Street, but most of the damage was from the V2s late in the war because they, you know, they weren't really aimed. They were just sort of lobbed at London and, and landed where they would. Um, so in, in terms of the buildings and the street layout, that was fairly easy. Um, then it became a matter of um, newspaper articles or surveys that were done of the city, um, just trying to get a, a taste for what places were like. Um, as you say now, Seven Dials and, and Common Garden in general is a lot more upmarket than it was. I mean, even really, I mean, Common Garden really up until the early 80s was not a place, uh, certainly not recognisable as it is now. I mean, it, it, no. was, it was pretty grim. And I mean, at, at one point in the, I think the late 60s, they were even arguing to knock the whole place down because they wanted a motorway to go through the centre of London and really? Common Garden was going to be one of the places that, wow. that, that disappeared. Um, so that, that's, a fairly, that's a fairly modern thing. But uh, reading, also, I liked reading novels set at the time I think fiction can often be a great research tool Mm. um, more so than the non-fiction written at the time because novelists like the feel of things as opposed to just the facts and and that can be helpful uh, reading back on the time. Yeah because I guess that sort of you know that sort of the club feeling you know being actually you don't always you don't get that really from a sort of a textbook or I guess you can from photos and things you can but even so it's still it's still not the same as you know you know a time machine I guess would be really great to be able to (laughs) go back although you might not want to go back there because I mean the the book does sort of touch on some really sort of um you know not not pleasant side of of London does it you know we've got sex workers we've got you know trafficking we've got murder you know all the sort of things that make that darkness um did it was it difficult to write some of the scenes because Geats gets emotionally involved with one of the characters in the book um I won't give too much away because um but she's she's in it from the beginning isn't she really and she you know she gets pulled into a lot of things was it difficult to write the scenes around that side of the book yeah it is and it isn't um because you want your characters to be real, you want them to have different levels to them. So, you know, there's ups and downs when you write their narratives, but you sort of take a holistic approach to it. So, you know, one goes hand in hand with the other and, and all of it develops the characters and the narrative that you're working on. Um, but yeah, when you're in it, sometimes um, sometimes it can be tricky, although I think anybody who's read my previous books will know that I, I don't mind doing a little bit of damage to some of my characters. So um, <laughs> um, I think sometimes you, you've got to, in crime fiction, you know, I find you have to maintain a certain sense of menace, I think, for even mm-hmm. your biggest characters. Um, yeah. There needs to be something on the line. So, Yeah, you don't want, 
you don't want the reader to know what's going to happen. I, somebody said something, if, if you're surprised, because I think that's one of the things, isn't it? if you're surprised by what your characters do, then your reader will be surprised by what, because like, yeah, I think for sure. yeah. I don't really, I don't want to start reading a murder mystery and know by halfway through the book what's going to happen. I think for me, it's like, I want to get to the last sort of, you know, four or five pages and and then, you know, discover, still up, yeah. <laughs> discover what happens, even if it's mortifying. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't <laughs> kill that person. <laughs> Was there anything in your research that really sort of shocked or surprised you when you were re researching Vine Street? I guess that's more, um, it's a matter of perspective, isn't it? Because sometimes I guess we can have this view of certain periods in history as being maybe a little bit more prim than they actually are particularly maybe the 30s and 40s because we have movies from that time but obviously they had um censor issues you, know, mm. you couldn't release films in america with, with certain issues being shown so british films tended to adhere to the american production code which gives this sort of odd impression um of a high morality of that period which really isn't the case um so when I was researching particularly the clubs and uh, Jack Iso, who was one of the yeah. big club owners at the time and famously later owned Iso's uh, nightclub and cafe, um, which became a, a go-to location for Sinatra and Hollywood stars when they came over. But his early ones were literally basement clubs. And then the first really, I wouldn't call it upmarket, but the Shim Sham Club on Wardour Street, uh, which is, there's a ersatz Irish, plastic Irish bar now, it's a disgrace, but that, that's what was the Shim Sham. Um, the complaints from some of the local uh, citizens around there about what went on there was quite eye-opening. Um, particularly, the there appeared to be quite a lot of cloakrooms at the Shim Sham, um, which I think were there for just more than just the facilities you would usually expect. Um, <laughs> so the, the organised level of entertainment in these places, um, yeah, was, was a bit of an eye-opener. Yeah, because, I mean, sort of like you say, it, you think that those sort of 1930s you're sort of thinking you know there were probably pockets of of areas in in the, that had like the the gangs and the, the different communities coming together and all those sorts of things but I imagine that you know like most places is that the the police and everybody in sort of you know higher powers want to keep that sort of on the lowdown they don't want people mm. to know that that's going on because they don't want these places to become popular or you know, all this thing to be happening on their doorstep. And I guess that's where, like in this, isn't it? The police are, you know, they're trying to stop this happening. Um, yeah. um, you know, I think sometimes they were happy as long as it didn't make too much noise because, I mean, even in Mayfair, there have always been illicit clubs and the people that live there, which, you know, you can sort of get this idea of sort of hoity-toity Edwardians uh, mm. roaming the streets. But, you know, they were using the clubs just as often as, as people that lived in, in less affluent areas. Um, obviously they were probably policed in a more hands-off fashion um, and didn't tend to have neon signs outside or anything. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, I mean, I think the crime that came with it is a bigger problem in somewhere like Soho because there was a, a huge criminal element um, that often started running some of these premises as well. Um, so, and interestingly, I mean, the, the book goes through the war and the war had a fairly big effect on that because you, you had this huge clash between um the italian uh, community and the jewish community which you know everybody knows about the, the different clashes and conflicts that happened on the streets of london um, in the lead up to the war because of the rise of fascism on the continent and that became yeah. particularly in the italian community where i think the there's always been a sort of a romantic notion of fascism almost um and that was they were pretty loud about it in some areas of soho so that that, that spilled out onto the streets but because the gangs were Italian, um, certainly in the West End, when the war came, I mean, a lot of them had actually been born in Italy. So they were actually, like Darby Sabini was interned in a camp, um, like some of the German-born citizens were. So all mm. of a sudden, a lot of the <laughs> a lot of the gangs kind of got cleared up through nothing to do with the actual crime of the era. Oh, but the right, state yeah, interesting. Down, yeah, because they were seen as sort of uh, enemy alien uh, citizens. So that, that had a, um, a fairly strong effect on, on the crime in the area. And led to different gangs coming through then after the war. Yeah, because I guess that was like you say, like an evolving sort of thing with you know the gangs coming through. And I was found that really fascinating in the book, you know, that because there's so there is a lot, isn't there? There's a lot of people in and a lot of, and it's how they're 
their link because you know when they're investigating it it's like this is this person you've got like red max and you've got this person and and then this person is you know linked to them and and it was the characters that in the book are so detailed and 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 also complex you know in and who their relationships are with and which characters came first in your sort of in your process and did they change as you wrote them um Gates and Kassar was sort of there from the start, the, the ideas I had for them, um, and, and Billy, those, those three. Yeah. And then as I started to fill out the locations, I mean, Simone's a pretty good character. She runs um, Chez Renee's, um, which was actually, there was a Chez Renee's on Lyle Street, um, but it was it was run by different people at the time, didn't last very long. So I made it sort of a bigger thing than it, than it actually was. Um, so you, yeah, you start filling out the characters then to, as to what you need, but the, the central, that, that sort of triangle of central characters were always there. Um, I mean, it, interestingly, at, at one point, because it, it's a book that had been in my mind for a long time, almost a mm. decade, in different forms. And at one point it was set in the West Midlands and around Birmingham, which, I mean, some of the book still is, but um, the whole thing was set up there. Um, so the actual specificness of Soho didn't exist at that point. Um, but the, the jazz scene in Birmingham was nowhere near as big or as lively right. as it was in London. Um, I also toyed with having some of it in Cardiff. There's a there's a little bit in Cardiff late on in the book, but um, it, they, those cities just weren't big enough, really, for no. the the sort of broad canvas I wanted for it. And Soho at the time, um, the jazz there, it, it, it was really the only place to play jazz in the country. You know, with, with more than one venue. I mean, there was the Birmingham Hippodrome, but I couldn't set the whole thing in one place. Um, I needed that that sprawl. Because mm-hmm. the feeling of the book was what I had really before I had the plot. Um, I, I knew how I wanted it to read. I knew how I wanted it to, to feel, that sort of dreamlike texture that I wanted from it. Um, in fact, that was a problem because the first time I pitched it, I didn't really have a plot. So I'm talking to my editor <laughs> about how the book feels. And he's just kind of like, yeah, uh, OK, maybe might not. Might need a little bit more um, than that. <laughs> yeah, so it, it took some convincing. But um, yeah, so... London became the perfect locum for that um, in the end. And really, it now feels inevitable. Like, I don't think I, I couldn't have written about any place other than Soho, really. It had to be there. So, ten, I mean, 10 years, you said 10 years is a long time to have a book in your head. Was that because that was like from, was that from sort of idea, you know, the seed of a thought to, to the book being finished? Or was yeah, it? I was, I was interested in the gangs initially and, and writing about, the street level guys like I mean a, a lot of historical novels take in sort of you know famous people that we've heard of yeah um, but I was interested in, in writing about the, the proper worm's eye view of it um but then Peaky Blinders happened mm. and I hadn't actually started I, I you know I'd, I'd done reading I'd taken notes and stuff and then I when they announced Peaky Blinders and I looked at it I thought right I mean it's Birmingham and I've gone to London now but it it feels similar territory you know gangs race courses whatever yeah um so I sort of let it go at that point because I hadn't started it but it was always it was always there in the back of my mind um and I guess it just kind of changed and and found different shapes um and then eventually I just thought well it, it is its own thing and, yeah. and it's something I desperately want to write so um um and to be honest, if lockdown hadn't happened when it did, I may not have written it or I may have written it later. I mean, that was really the spur because at that point I just thought, well, I need to do something. I'm not going to sit yeah. home and think about all of this. <laughs> Horror show, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I didn't have anything else that I was writing at the time. Um, After Dark had just come out. Um, and obviously it wasn't the most welcoming of, uh, of uh, atmospheres for books. I mean, bookshops were shut. There were no events. There was Absolutely, no nothing. yeah. It was really home. hard. Yeah. Um, so more than anything else just to distract myself to compartmentalize uh, I thought all right, I'm gonna gonna do this now and not really have any expectations maybe of, of publishing it as I say because I'd had conversations with my editor mm. there, really. but um it was just there was a freedom to it there was a liberty to it because I didn't have a deadline I didn't have no. anything really just sit there every day and and live in the world that I was creating which uh, at the time even as violent and grim as some of Vine Street can be seemed more fun than the actual real world at the time yeah, well, I can yeah, completely understand that bit, living through it because I think that you know, I guess even though you know Vine Street is you know has its thing, it's it's an escapism, isn't it? You know, crime fiction is is an escape, 
Um, mm. It's it's you know you're going away from the reality, whatever the reality may be, whether it's your day to day, you know, going to work and doing that, or being stuck indoors in a pandemic. So I think it had different meanings for different people, and and writers seem to have either thrived on it and in, and been able to write, or gone completely the other way and, and not been able to. So fortunately for mm. us, you, you were one of the ones who could because Vine Street may not happen. Yeah, well, my circumstances helped as well. I mean, I don't have kids, and I, you know, I know a lot of writers that were suddenly locked in their house with a couple of kids crawling up the wall, trying and, to teach them. Yeah, yeah, trying to find space to write in that. <laughs> yeah, it's is, is just a nightmare. Um, yeah, but you know, the only responsibility I had was to myself. So that in that, it was almost a, you don't want to say it was a gift, but I was able to take advantage yeah. of the situation in a way that benefited me um, in that, and and have a lot of fun with it. I mean, it was. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm a writer that likes writing. Yeah. I'm not one of these people that sort of, you know, finds it tricky or moans about the actual process of it. I'm, if anything, I'm the complete opposite. I get a sort of a delirious high off it at times. You know, I get halfway through things and think I'm the greatest writer in the universe. <laughs> um, there's there's a, a real sense of joy about it, which which I wanted to be on the page as well. I mean, like, I mean, it is it is a dark novel, it's a crime novel, but I think it moves, it it dances in a way that I think is yeah. quite joyful. It's really, gr- I mean, yeah, it's really engrossing. And as I said to you, I'm halfway through and I, I literally was, I wanted to read it at work today, which I obviously couldn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but after we finished, I am going to be carrying on. So, because <laughs> um, it, it is, it's, it, it's, there's so much in it that you want to. And I, I think it's almost one of those books that you could read again and find a lot more because it, there's so much detail in it and 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 I guess that when you're reading it for the first time you miss that because there's so much going on but you know I, mm. I think it's great but did you um with your previous books um the Abigail Boone um series which is is a contemporary novel isn't it it's a contemporary detective yeah. series um what inspired you to sort of do that you said about the lockdown and things but has has Abigail because I haven't read the other two books has Ab- Abigail has she finished or is there going to be more of Abigail or um I went, well she's still out there doing her thing but the thing with Boone was I mean the, the character was a, a former detective who sort of becomes this outlaw vigilante figure and there's only so many times I think plausibly you can have that kind of person running around solving mysteries um I mean both of the books are actually deeply linked it's not really separate mysteries the, the, the second right. book after is kind of spins out of the sprawl of the first one the results of what happens at the end of the first one um but to have that kind of person running around solving different mysteries you know every week like Poirot or something just it just wouldn't really work um I mean I, I wanted to write essentially a PI novel that's what I was interested in but the private eye is a it's not a particularly English figure, is it? It's, no. it's something I think, or personally, I associate with American literature a lot more, or the, the sort of the classic who done it. Yeah. Um, so I had to find a way around it, um, and making her almost work the other side of the the line um, was the way into that. But um, a lot happens to to Boone in the two novels, <laughs> and I, I'm not sure if she would have got away with the third one. Um, so pretty early on, we. I mean, the, the, the first book wasn't even out and I decided we weren't going to do a third one immediately. Um, I needed, I wanted to look at something else. Yeah. But I mean, they, they were the first books I published. They weren't the first books I ever wrote. And uh, the books I wrote before were period pieces. So Vine Street, in many ways, is actually a return to what I was doing previously yeah. and a return to writing the kind of books that I thought I always would publish um, before Boone sort of happened and almost took on a life of her own in the middle of it. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd say Vine Street was more like a homecoming uh, to me, writing the kind of yeah. stuff I really wanted to write. That was, you know, with the with the sort of historical crime, is that something I was going to ask you? One of the questions was, uh, are you writing at the moment? And is that is that in the same sort of uh, because I haven't actually got because I haven't got to the end. I don't know if there's going to be a possible for it to be a sequel. And I don't know that I want to know that. But I mean, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I'm, I'm sort of in the planning stages of something at the moment which is i, I wouldn't call it a sequel connected um, connected that's good that, the, that's i'll take that <laughs> it's in the same london um yeah. but it, it's set in the 50s a little bit a little bit after most of the action of vine street um 
this is the the main characters are, are, are different but because I, london has become what i'm interested in, in yeah. writing um through the crime that happens i mean I, the history of crime is more or less the history of the world anyway so the, the history of any city is quite often yeah. it's crime or it's politics which more often than not are the same thing um so and yeah the 50s is a pretty fertile sort of post yeah i was gonna thing. say sort of 50s 60s um mm. def- you know are still sort of there's a lot going on isn't there so um yeah, and the way it cha- I mean, the nature of crime changed in some ways. I mean, you still had gangs, but you had yeah. Billy Hill pulling off his sort of elaborate robberies, which was a new wrinkle uh, on on the criminal world. Um, and you also had sort of uh, you had Notting Hill and race issues, Peter Rackman, stuff like that. So there's yeah, there's a lot to work with there. Do you like the sort of do you you like the sort of being able to have the you know the the real life figures sort of slotting into the into the fiction so you have that sort of poetic you know license to do what you want with them but also make it real because I think that's the thing isn't it is at the beginning of this book you say it's based on a somewhat true story Mm. um which I really like that so is that important for you to have that sort of real and fiction you know merge together yeah I mean I, I like taking uh real characters real historical data but then manipulating it basically I'm I'm yeah i'm not somebody that swears an oath um no to remain sort of any kind of fidelity to chronology so to speak um authenticity i'm interested in yeah i'm interested in creating a world that could have happened whether it did or didn't is almost irrelevant um and i think if if the reader can believe that it could have happened that's to me that's the important thing yeah um i I don't even i'm not interested in even knowing the difference between what the real stuff and and the imaginated stuff is um in terms of the book um, but definitely I like populating them with real people yeah. and, and using the world that people can just kind of recognise and remember as the setting for it. The book has lots of twists and turns. Is it difficult when you're writing it to sort of remember what's going on or does that sort of just come, do you sort of have that plot and you know or do you have to sort of have other ways of, of managing the plot? Um, I I plan um beforehand quite a lot i usually plan about two thirds of the novel and I always have the ending in mind now any of that can change um but i like having a roadmap there yeah to start with i find it difficult to start without it more the structure is more important to me how, how i think the structure is going to work so vine street moves backward and forward in time you, i mean you, you have the main narrative that starts in the 30s and runs through to the 60s um but there are interstitial uh, chapters um, yeah. as late as 2002, but also d- in, during the 60s in between the other bits. Um, and w- when I've got the picture of how the structure is going to work, then I'm good to go. I sort of get all locks into place at that point for me. Um, and the map isn't the territory, so you, you can make a plan. But then when you're out there actually roaming around in it and writing it, a- anything can change. Um, and quite often does. I, I normally stop and have a break at about the two thirds or three quarters mark and almost do a structure later at that point because I'm not somebody that redrafts a lot or hardly at all to be honest um I like working slower about yeah. a thousand words a day but getting it done into a pretty near finished state at that point and changing things as I go along particularly before the final act so that when I'm going into the final bits I know exactly what I'm doing and, and what's happened and where everything else is going um so at the end of my working draft isn't that far away from what will actually be published uh, um that's the way i prefer to work and, yeah uh, but as a right you find your own process definitely because some people just like to like you know get it all out don't they sort of and then yeah, have definitely. to like do lots of editing but you got yeah work as it yeah. as you go along so yeah. and one's not better than the other i mean it's, no, you need, it's you need to find work. whatever tools and whatever process works for you as an individual and for some people it is like you say i mean at the moment people are doing this you know writing a novel in a month thing in november which blows my mind people writing 70 <laughs> blows words my mind month. <laughs> mad people what you have to um because I, I you know i need a plan and i need time to get the whole thing breathing in my head as well so yeah. writing more than a thousand words a day would just just terrify me I'm not interested in that um but i mean equally if, if you don't you know there there's this whole sort of plotters versus pantsers if you write by the seat of your pants yeah but i think if you do that you essentially do the planning later 
because you have to do rewriting on it. So really everybody's doing the same work. You're just doing it at different times. Doing it different. I guess it's yeah. like everything in, in life, isn't it? Some people find it easier to do some things in some order and some people find it, it yeah. just, like you say, finding your way. And are you constantly thinking about new plots when you're sort of, you know, when you're working or when you're sort of doing other things or? Yeah, I'm, plots are sort of the last thing I worry about uh, as I said, I, I, I knew I wanted this book to feel, and that's that's usually how it works with me, yeah. or a character. So with, with Boone, I had this character sort of running around in the back of my mind for a while I didn't know what to do with. Um, and it was when I got the concept of uh, memory loss that the book started to come together. Um, the actual crime plots are generally the thing I then work last, because, you know, that to me is... I guess I'm more from the hard-boiled tradition than the murder mystery tradition. So yeah. you know, if you if you're writing sort of Christie-esque stuff, the actual plot, I guess, is is vital. It's, it's central to it. Yeah. Whereas I prefer writing about the person who's doing the yeah. investigating, so more character-driven. Than, than, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that the, I mean, a lot of plot stuff actually changes while I'm writing it. That kind of stuff, I would like. You know, you sort of see almost unconscious connections that you've made yourself and you're like oh yeah hold on a second maybe I'll go back and change that yeah. better this way after all um which will be difficult if you're writing you know like a locked room mystery or something because you need the moving parts to be in your mind I think at the beginning yeah that makes my head hurt thinking about that <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> um we're nearly at the end I've, I've just clocked the time and um so just a, a quick question before we finish is what do you like reading Dominic what's what's your sort of what's your thing Probably quite widely. I like a lot of things, but I mean, I do like crime. Um, I like character-driven crime at the moment. I'm see this. I'm reading uh, William Boyle. Oh yes. Um, I don't think it's out. This is the American edition. I think it comes out next year on No Exit. Um, he's very good. He's kind of like a Brooklyn Elmore Leonard. I mean, it, the you sometimes don't even realise what the plot is until halfway through. He just kind of throws characters together and, and stuff happens um I, but he's, he's fantastic so I, I like that kind of crime um i probably read probably read more american crime than i do british stuff but um i did read uh tg Jin's uh keeping the house this year which i thought was one of the best novels it's sort of a north london set in the turkish community around green lanes it's about um heroin trafficking in cabbages um that was a that's one of the best crime novels i think of this year I like that a lot can you read crime when you're writing crime Depends. When I was writing Past Life, um, which, as I said, was a bit of a bit of a change of direction at the time in in what I was writing, I was I went back and started reading a lot of my favourites and more like rereading just to sort of familiarise myself with the form. Yeah. But when I wrote After Dark, I didn't read anything at all um, because it felt like a kind of a broadcast that I didn't want to be picking up whilst I was writing. Mm. Um, Vine Street was weird because it was in lockdown and it took longer. I mean, the, the Abigail Boone novels probably took three or four months each for me to write, but Vine Street was sort of nine or ten months, so I was taking it in a more relaxed way. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a bigger book anyway. Um, so I was reading here and there, but definitely the volume that I read while writing drops quite significantly. Yeah. That seems to be quite sort of, I know a lot of people say that they they're worried they might sort of pick things up by osmosis if they're reading and, and yeah, they'll, I mean, I they'll read. You can do it unconsciously, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you can completely, they'll read something completely different to what they normally read because if they're writing mm. crime, they won't read crime or they're writing a romance, they won't read romance or that sort of thing. So I guess as long as you don't mix up your, you don't want to mix up your 1930s and your 1970s, <laughs> do you? <laughs> it could go, go very wrong. <laughs> Oh, well, I've really enjoyed talking to you this evening, Dominic. It's been really great. And I'm absolutely loving Wine Street and I shall be finishing it this week. So I'll be posting my review as well. So um, thank you right. for introducing me to your characters and, and into 1930s Soho, which I had not experienced before. So I'm not sure I'd want to go and visit, but... Um... No, we'll keep it on the page. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Um, if you... Um, would like to join us next week we will be um changing uh genre and we'll be going to talk to author jessica thorne and her 
um, book is called The Bookbinder's Daughter. If you would like to um, enjoy, well, my words are all going muddled up now. If you've enjoyed this event, please like and add a comment. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe to our page. Thank you again, Dom, for joining us this evening. It's been great. Um, yeah, and, been great. Um, and yes, and good, good luck with the book. And we look forward to seeing what comes next. Thank you. Thank you.